Hi, welcome again to Off the Page. My guest today is Jim Marr. He's the author of a book called Too Many to Mourn. He has very close family ties to many people who died in the Halifax explosion of December 6, 1917. And we're going to talk about some of the tragedy and the miracles of that particular day. Hi, Jim. Hi. Good to have you here in the studio. Thank you. Nice to be here. Briefly describe, if you would, that very explosion that happened that morning in December of 1917. It started with uh, two ships colliding in the Narrows, which is the narrow body of water between Halifax Harbor and Bedford Basin. The whole thing makes an hourglass uh, configuration. The two ships that collided were the uh, Imo and the Mont Blanc. The Imo was rather innocuous. It was a Belgian re relief ship, and it was uh, empty at the time. It was heading for New York to load up with blankets and medical supplies for the war-torn areas of uh, Europe. But the Mont Blanc carried a, a cargo of almost 3,000 tons of explosives. Um, the fault of the explosion has never really been settled. They eventually, in the high courts in London, declared that both ships were equally to blame. But the problem started, the, the Mont Blanc had a very poorly loaded uh, deck cargo of benzene in barrels, drums. And when the two ships collided, the bow of the Imo broke through the deck and hit these drums and started them spilling onto the deck. Well then, as it backed out of the thing, the ragged metal on one ship created sparks which started the fire. Now, the moment that fire started, it was beyond control. It, it was a massive fire. And, and obviously what, what was about to happen next was going to go much further than just the harbor itself or the activity right. of these two ships right. that collided. Um, the ship, the Mont Blanc, drifted across the harbor until it was just about touching Pier 6, which is at the foot of uh, Richmond Street in Halifax. The crew of the Mont Blanc, they escaped to their lifeboats and got out of there and uh, went over to the Dartmouth side. They knew what was going to happen. They knew what was mm. going They were one of the few people that knew what was going to happen. And they got out of off the ship and they got up into the woods over on the Tufts Cove area. And uh, only one of them was killed in the explosion, and that was by a piece of metal from the Mont Blanc that went across the harbor, hit him, and started massive bleeding, and he bled to death. But the Mont Blanc at this point, at the moment that it exploded, it was touching Pier 6. And uh, the explosion of that much um, material is almost impossible to comprehend. And I, in the book, explain by comparing it to the Oklahoma City uh, explosion, mm -hmm. which took place April 19th, 1995. In that, there was one van parked in front of the building with 1,100 pounds of explosives. And when it uh, detonated, it destroyed that nine-story um, uh, federal building uh, plus, it did, it did uh, structural damage to 16 other buildings in the area. Now, for that blast to have equaled the blast from the Mont Blanc, there would have been necessary to have 5,300 vans parked in front of that building. Wow. And it's been compared even to a, a nuclear explosion as well. It has often been compared that it was uh, the largest man-made explosion up to the first atomic bomb. So it's almost incomprehensible what that explosion could do to that part of the city. <clears throat> Plenty of houses, factories, people working in shipyards, very, very close to the center yes, of that well, explosion. Um, the, the area that was hardest hit was the Richmond area of Halifax plus the rest of the North End. And if, you, if I were sitting here and this is the Mont Blanc and I'm facing the city and I'm facing Richmond Street, then all of the houses on Richmond Street, v, uh, or V Street rather, Barrington Street and Union Street and Albert Street are 
dead on head, ahead of me, plus the fact that it is a steep hill there from Water's Edge to Gottingen Street is just about 200 feet in elevation. So the Richmond area was like a shooting gallery with shelves and even the houses on one side of the street were higher than the houses on the other, so there was no protection, full blast right at it. The death toll in that area was in excess of, of 90 percent. Um, on V Street alone there was 149 people, not counting the Protestant orphanage, and uh, only seven survived. Wow. I want to talk a, a bit about the more of the physical effects, but I want to kind of get to the personal side of things too here. Your mother was there that morning. Yes, she was. What within, was she doing? It, it started, she, uh, her husband, uh, Joseph Hinch, he was uh, working all night. And uh, when he came home, it was a few minutes before nine. And he told her that there was a ship on fire in the harbor. Now, um, they couldn't see it from their home because the Hillis foundry was in front of their home. So she said, well, I'm going out and have a look. So he said, all right. He said, you go out. And he said, I'll have my breakfast and I'll come out with you. So she left the house. And uh, in the house when she left was her husband and all 10 of their children. And uh, so she left the house and she started walking down V Street towards Richmond Street. And as she was passing a house that was on the other side of the street, the explosion took place. And the house that protected her from the shrapnel that's coming from that ship, um, the house, everything blew, and she ended up on the other side of the street in a ditch with about six feet of debris over her. But she survived. The rest of she her family survived. wasn't as fortunate. Uh, her hip was badly injured, but uh, she survived. But her husband and all ten of the children were killed. And uh, after the blast, one of the things that had happened is most of the North End burned. And the house that they had been in was 66 V Street. And that burned for uh, over two weeks before they found the bodies. The wow. bodies by this time were so charred that uh, Joseph Hinch was put in one casket and all ten of the children were put in the other casket and they were both buried at Mount Olivet Cemetery. Mm. Now this this started as a very ordinary day. All over that part oh, yes. of the town people yes. were just yeah. going about their yeah. normal day-to-day -day normal, stuff. Normal run-of-the-mill day. Uh, it was wartime and it was about the third year of the war. They had uh, Money was easy to come by. They worked a lot of overtime, and most of them worked either with the railway or the shipyards or uh, the waterfront and what have you. So uh, this was a very tight, tightly knit group. The uh, most of them were um, immigrants who had uh, come over to get away from either the potato famine or discrimination and so on and so forth. And of course they ran into discrimination when they got into Halifax. They, even in the uh, years before the war, <clears throat> occasionally a company would have be advertising for employees and down at the bottom they, they would have a thing like, no Irish need apply, mm. you know. Prejudice and this had Irish. gradually lessened and uh, they were finding a good life and they had money they could dream and they could plan. And, uh, but they were not soldiers, they weren't trained, mm -hmm. they had no idea of disaster such as that. Right. And uh, the majority of those killed, at least 80% of those killed were women and children. I mean, they were certainly not uh, prepared for anything like that. And there, there were schools nearby there. Kids were, were in the classrooms or getting ready to go right. to school. Saint, what what Saint, kind of things were happening in those schools? Well, at St. Joseph's School, uh, this, uh, the classes there started at 9 o'clock, and at the Richmond School, they didn't start until 9.30. They just brought in their wintertime hours. And uh, the schools uh, took a terrible beating. All four churches in the Richmond area were smashed beyond repair. There was uh, immediately they lost 
all their educational facilities and the religious facilities and uh, so on. It was pretty well wiped out. The Richmond area was just blown sideways. There was uh, nothing left. There was a tidal wave of sorts that followed in the wake of this explosion yes, as well that went way up this hill. That's badly misunderstood. Uh, some books you read, you, you get the impression the tidal wave went over the entire city. Actually, it was confined only to the Richmond area. It went from a, on a, a lobe from about uh, the uh, Fort Needham down to Duffus Street on one side and down to North Street on the other. At its deepest coming over the Halifax side, it would have probably been somewhere between 20 and 30 feet deep. Now, it was powerful. It just tore uh, engines off of the railway tracks and it uh, washed away uh, freight cars. They found a freight car floating in the harbor after it. And uh, it washed many of the bodies back into the harbor and some people that were still alive back into the harbor. And, uh, but it, um, was not as widespread. Many of the effects that happened were confined to the Richmond area. This, in fact, when I first started writing the book, my uh, working title was The View from Richmond, and uh, this was changed by Nimbus Publishing to Too Many to Mourn. But I was always looking at it from the view, point of view of the Richmond families because they suffered the most. And here's the sequence of disasters, the fire, the explosion, the, the crashing down buildings, mm. the shattering glass, the, uh, the fires that happen afterwards, a, a tidal wave of sorts happening there at the same time. And, you know, obviously this is a, an unaware public, completely unprepared for what's happening. Yes, Shock well, and disbelief you have and none despair of the, all around. Uh, emergency services that you have today. Uh, you have, uh, you had none of the services that uh, supply counseling to those that have been through a traumatic event. Um, at the moment of the explosion, there was a fireball. Many of people that were down close to the, f to the ship that was burning, and it, it was an overwhelming attraction. This was really something everybody was trying sure. to get as close as they could. V only a handful of people knew what was on board the Mont Blanc. And those that moved that close, Many of them were incinerated. Uh, the, uh, they, their bodies were never found. And uh, then following that, the ship itself, it had almost six, well, the ship itself weighed uh, 3,121 tons, and it had almost that much on it in explosives. So pound for pound, it equals the weight of the ship. So if you were to take a pound of TNT and put it in your car and explode it, there would not be too much of your car left. So How the, far away did fragments actually go in this explosion the from anchor, the ship itself? Uh, the shaft of the anchor was about the largest piece, and it traveled about two and a half miles over the city. It weighed 1,212 pounds, and it dug into the ground at an angle that they calculated back from that angle. From the angle of inclination, they calculated that it would have been two miles high as it passed over the city, but it landed approximately two and a half miles away. That's incredible. Yeah. We're going to take a short break right now. My guest is Jim Marr. We're talking about the Halifax explosion of 1917, and we'll be back right after this. This series is brought to you as a public service by Mount St. Vincent University. And we're back. I'm talking today with Jim Marr. We're talking about the Halifax explosion of December 6, 1917. Uh, Jim, you've documented many things about the victims and the survivors. Ada Moore was one of the people who survived that day. What happened to her that day? She was actually blown out of the house. She was standing in the doorway of her home on Barrington Street, and uh, the low pressure system behind the blast, um, her house exploded outward and blew her out into the middle of the street. Uh, she only suffered some minor scratches, and uh, she was 
the only one uh, in the, at, on the day of the explosion, there were 66 members of the Jackson family in Richmond. Uh, 46 of them were killed. 19 were injured, and Ada was the only one that was uninjured. This chart, you can probably just see the overall details. All the red dots on there are the, the people who were killed in this That's extended right. family, and yeah. then some of the others survived. But obviously, it was a you know, a devastating effect on just that one family as well as others. Yes, as I say, 46 of them were killed and, and that was the largest death toll for any extended family. In addition to that, my mother, um, losing her husband and all 10 of her children, suffered the, the greatest loss for one single family unit. Well, and I guess even for people who survived, they had this impossible task of coping with that disaster around them and coping with, with the death that was staring them in the face, if not in their kitchens, in the streets. Uh, it must have been you know, like a terrible psychological effect. I don't really know how many of them uh, stood that sort of a loss. Uh, I don't know how I would handle it or um, anyone I know would handle it. but. They drew upon a, an inner strength. I like to refer to it as quiet courage. And this is the courage that's not the flamboyant courage of racing into a burning building and rescuing somebody. This is the courage that allows you to accept the unacceptable and, and bear the unbearable and get on with your life. Now they would have a, a long period of mourning in many cases with them, but eventually they uh, got on with their lives. I know my mother really ever talked about the explosion. It was a painful subject for her. But she had great serenity. She, she was very calm and she, I don't think I, I can't remember her ever losing her temper or getting upset about something. She accepted everything as being God's will and uh, she simply got on with her life. And she actually led a good life after that. Uh, as a child, I remember her, um, she clowned around and laughed and joked and, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of a, that if you did not know she was in that explosion, you would not have suspected it from her demeanor. And uh, Is that part of what inspired you to write a book like this? Is how do people get on with their lives and become good individuals, as you're describing your mother to me? You, you have, in this world, you have, to, you have to accept what's handed to you. You have to get on with your own life, and you have to um, um, be strong enough to keep going when things are bad. And uh, I think uh, many of them handled it in their own way. They all had their own method of dealing with this tragic event. Uh, Ada, for example, very rarely talked about anything except the Halifax explosion, whereas my mother never spoke of it at all. And the family connections were broken at that point. Like, I've, since the book came out, I've been in touch or one of the people that is a child of one of the survivors called me and he said all his life he has been trying to find out something about the family but everyone that knew anything was either dead or they wouldn't talk about it or whatever. Yes. And he said, when I picked up your book, there was the answer to every question I ever asked. And he thanked me so much for writing the book. And since that time, we're now running into cousins I didn't know I had. There's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so far, it's up around about 15 of them. And uh, that's really a reward uh, of writing the book is to meet these people. And they're, they all seem to be very fine people and they, they just don't understand what happened during the explosion and this is now explaining it. It's sort of bringing a closure to the trauma for them. Even after, after all of these Even years. after all these years. You, you document heroism and, and miracles. Um, what, what kinds of impossible good things happened that oh, day for well, the survivors? Oh, um, well, there was one young boy, he is, his name was uh, William Edmonds, and he was again a victim of that low pressure system. The actual low pressure system did more damage in the city than the actual wall of air. The wall of air cleaned out Richmond and part of the North End, but for the rest of the city it was the low pressure system. 
But he was in his kitchen at home, and uh, he was blown out through the kitchen window, and he was suffered quite a few cuts. And that was like an immediate after effect of the explosion oh, itself. Oh, this was immediately at the split time. Second yeah, yeah, just split mm -hmm. second, uh, microsecond mm. after the blast, and uh, he landed in the backyard, and he was badly cut. Now his father, uh, his mother was injured, and his father looked at him and thought that he was dead, you see, and he, actually he was blown out. He was lying there for a minute or so, or less than a minute, and a link from the anchor chain of the Mont Blanc came down, and it was red hot because the ship had burned for, for uh, 20 minutes. And it came down and it severed his leg just above the knee. And it was hot enough that it cauterized the wound, prevented further breathing, bleeding. So. Uh, his father looked at him and thought he was dead and uh, didn't do anything about him because he had more immediate problems with the family members that were injured. Oh. And later in the afternoon, there was a um, horse and cart came along and was picking up bodies. And they picked William up and put him on the cart with the other bodies and uh, took him to the Shabakta Road School, which had been turned into a morgue, the basement of it. So he was lying there covered and uh, near midnight, he moaned, and they raced over and got him and took him down to Camp Hill Hospital, and he survived. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with Jim Marr after this. If you'd like more information about this program or any of the courses we offer at a distance, call us or visit our website. We welcome your comments. We've been watching uh, off the page today, and my guess has been Jim Marr. We've been talking about the Halifax explosion, the, the devastation, all the terrible stuff. But there were good things that happened as a result of it. After you finish recording and researching all these details about the lives, um, what, what is there to be said about human resilience bouncing back from such a disaster like this? The massive damage that was done to the city uh, that's only a matter of replacing bricks and plaster and mortar and stones. And generally, the city was rebuilt better than it was originally. For instance, you now have Devonshire Avenue taking that grueling job of trying to get up Russell Street and so on. And uh, the city was planned better, and they ha where it was completely cleaned out, it was no problem to replan it and it came out better than it was. And in many cases, the lives of the people came out better than they were. Uh, Mr. Hugh Mills, who uh, later started Mills Brothers on Spring Garden Road, he was the one that found my mother and saw to it that she was taken to a hospital ship, an American hospital ship. And uh, that influenced his life because he went on to be very interested in the Red Cross, that he saw so much bleeding and so on and so forth. And he became interested in children, and he had seen so many children killed. So he could do nothing for them, but he set up his Uncle Mel radio show, and he did a great deal of good over all the years for all the children, because these were children he could help. That's amazing. So they became and, better people. And there are many more stories like that, Jim. Oh, there's many stories like that, yes. Thanks for coming and sharing this with us today. It's been my pleasure. And I'm Leslie Choice. Thanks for watching the show today. I'll see you again next time. Mm -hmm.